Fuck. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Simmons Bunton, and I am the editor in chief and uh, publisher of terrain.org. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I just want to let you know that I'm here in Tucson, Arizona, and I acknowledge my presence on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascua Yaqui. Uh, I want to thank our readers this evening, Arthur Z, Susan Cohen, Christine, uh, Christina Morricone, and Cameron Walker. And I um, want to thank the audience, of course, and then thanks Derek she to Derek Sheffield, our poetry editor, for joining us uh, as the moderator. I'm going to say a few words, and he's really going to run the show this evening. I also want to give a special shout-out to Knight Law Firm PC, which is underwriting this event this evening so that we can have this hosted and available for you and, and pay our readers a little bit. So thanks very much to Knight Law Firm. If you're interested in underwriting or hosting, just let me know. Okay, um, some, you know, kind of administrative. If your connection becomes slow, you may want to turn off your video. In all cases, we ask that you remain muted, at least until the Q&A, uh, but you're welcome to post your questions and other positive feedback in the chat. We are, as I think you've seen, recording this and all um, of these readings, and we'll make them available on our YouTube channel. And in fact, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can um, follow us from there. And I wish you would, because if, as soon as we get 100 followers, we'll actually be able to change our URL for that to something much better than the 19-digit setup that it is now. So find us on YouTube. Um, our series, as I think you know, is held on the fourth Monday of every month. On April 26th, in honor of Earth Month and Poetry Month, Allison Hawthorne Deming is underwriting and hosts James Hirschfield, J. Drew Lanham, and Derek Sheffield, who is our host tonight. Links to register for this reading uh, may be found on terrain.org, as well as our Facebook page. Okay. I will be posting book links in the chat. Uh, in support of our readers this evening. But if you miss those or want to find other books by tonight's readers and other terrain.org contributors, I invite you to hop on over to our bookshop page at bookshop.org slash shop slash terrain org. And I'll put that in the chat here in a bit. Or find the link under about on the terrain.org website navigation menu. And then finally, a word, if I may, about terrain.org the world's first online journal of place, publishing since 1998. We are, as I think many of you know, an all-volunteer organization that doesn't charge to access our content, nor charge to submit other than the contest, nor contain any advertising at all. Indeed, we are run by the power of goodwill and dedicated weekends and evenings from our volunteers. And we are run by donations from good folks like you who are welcome to donate online at terrain.org slash donate. So thank you for your support and in advance for being a part of the terrain.org community. But enough about us. I hope now that you will enjoy the reading, followed by the Q&A, and thanks again for joining us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's host, Derek Sheffield. Derek's collection, Not For Luck, was selected by Mark Doty for the 2019 Wheelbarrow Books Poetry Prize and published on January 1st of this year. His other books include Through the Second Skin, which was a finalist for the Washington State Book Award, and Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy, which co-editors uh, Elizabeth Dodd and I are very excited about as well. When Derek isn't teaching at Wenatchee Valley College or editing poetry for terrain.org, he can often be found skiing, hiking, birding, botanizing, or forest bathing in the mountains of north central Washington. Derek, my friend, take it away. Shinrin yoku is the Japanese term for forest bathing. Yeah, that's there's a great book that Hannah Fries edited um, called Forest Bathing has a beautiful introduction by Robin Wall Kimmerer that I would uh, direct you to. Uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. It's, um, uh, it's a delight to be with you. And I know that it ain't easy to sign up for another hour of screen time these days. So we're grateful that you chose um, to, to spend this hour of screen time with us. 
Um, I am coming to you, as Simmons mentioned, from north central Washington, which is the ancestral homeland of the Pascuosa. We're going to go in this order tonight. Uh, Christi, Christina Morricone, our nonfiction contest winner, will start us off, followed by Susan Cohen, our poetry contest winner, then Cameron Walker, our fiction winner, and lastly, this year's poetry judge, Arthur C. Afterwards, we will have a little time for conversation. So if you have questions, uh, Simmons mentioned, please drop them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. <clears throat> Before I introduce Christina, I wanna suggest for those of you with um, big screens or maybe a second screen to go to terrain.org and click Christina Morricone's piece up on your screen, because as you will see, uh, when, if and when you do so, it is part poem and visual art. Um, what's more, after tonight's reading, I encourage you to find each writer's work and read the beautiful commendations from our judges, Julian Hoffman, Joy Castro, and Arthur Z. So, Christina Morricone is a poet, essayist, and visual artist whose work has appeared in a variety of literary journals and magazines, including Sonora Review, Brevity, Cobalt Review, Lumina, and others. Her work has also been included in the anthology Flash Nonfiction Food and her lyric narrative, In the Cloakroom of Proper Musings, was published by Atmosphere Press in August of 2020. Christina, congratulations on winning our nonfiction contest, being picked by the great Julian Hoffman. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Derek. Um, as Derek mentioned, uh, my piece is definitely uh, a hybrid of poetry, uh, of all the things I love, poetry, essay, writing, and visual art. So I tried to pick a part of this um, that does not require you to be looking at the visual art. Um, and also, the piece does begin with an introduction. And I didn't want to start at the beginning of this. I'm kind of reading from the middle. Um, but I do want to read just two lines from the introduction because they will sort of explain um, what's happening um, in the part I'm reading. I should warn that what is being constructed will likely not be ordered chronologically and it might switch points of view for the purpose of revelation. So it will switch points of view between I and she. So I'll begin. Inevitably, moments fall either before or after. That is time's most clever trick. We are left with no choice but to divide up our days, weeks, months, years, sort out and measure, classify and label. Before his diagnosis, they go to a local farm to pick strawberries, not knowing it is near the end of the picking season. In between rows of profuse green, the earth is sodden and straw covered. They each bend to lift the heavy leaves and stems, husband and wife, in search of. So many strawberries already overripe and rotted, some fallen, slugs having tunneled their way through the sweet fruit. They stay side by side at first, then separate to cover more ground. She takes a photograph of him from afar, his body a right angle, his broad shouldered back to the sun. He turns toward her, tips the basket he's holding to show her how many strawberries he's picked, 50 maybe. 100. I am always desiring numbers. She wipes the sweat from her forehead, feeling grateful in this moment for the healing they have done together, 
the work of remembering to be present, their marriage once fraught, filled with distraction, years of forgetting. After his diagnosis on a Sunday in need of diversion, the kind embedded in nature's detail, they go to the garden where time after time they let themselves get lost. There are paths to follow around the 35 acres. They wander instead, hand in hand. Midsummer flower beds swell at their roots. Thousands of stems push through the earth. Everything reminds her. The replicating, spreading, pollinating, spawning, growing wild. An abundance of tiny aquatic insect eggs and their masses deposited on the sandstone bottom of a shallow creek, cell-like magnified by the water. And a small field of poppies, some still crumpled in the bud, others in bloom, their petals falling away from tiny dark seeds clustered at the center. And the more obvious spotted oval leaves of pulmonaria lungwort, once thought to symbolize diseased, ulcerated lungs. Everything reminds her, a vast open air museum of comparative forms, all this dreadful resemblance. A treatment plan is formulated, a nurse navigator assigned, a proton therapy simulation carried out to ensure precision targeting. It is all math and chemistry and physics. The husband's body and approximation, a range of possibilities, a venue preparing to host a series of small angle scattering events. Days feel laden, beset, her body taut muscled, a knot having tied itself between the blades of her shoulders, make believe wings prone to make-believe flight. Sometimes a spark will flicker there, sometimes a raging fire. Either way, she knows the burn, the liability of matchstick bones, inflammation, the language of forewarning. Breathing is something she thinks about more after. Between pandemic and diagnosis, it seems unavoidable to consider such things once so seemingly ordinary, unremarkable. The body's need for respiration, air exchange, especially in the hospital, its interior broken down into smaller and smaller spaces, clearly marked now with instructions, COVID configurations of six feet apart and four people only everything measured, calculated, please stand here, please do not sit here. She sits waiting, a mask covering her mouth and nose. Inhale for four seconds, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, hold for five, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Exhale until there is no breath left in the lungs. It is impossible to hold one's breath to the point of completely stopping the rhythmic process of inhaling and exhaling, of taking in oxygen and discarding carbon dioxide. I learn this is an act that does not lie within the range of human volition. I learn 300 cubic feet of air are breathed in and out of a person's lungs every day, effortless, unchanging. A week before the pandemic, before flights are mostly grounded, at the wide edge of winter's end, they travel to Colorado to an altitude of 9,000 feet lower air pressure and a lower oxygen level straining the lungs, making it harder to breathe. It takes a day or two to adapt, acclimate. All the while this stage three disease had been there, 
It too had taken chairlifts and gondolas up even higher, almost beyond the tree line, skied down the deep powder of black diamonds, hidden, a stowaway inside the husband's chest. Somewhere behind the house where they stay on a walk, she finds a kind of makeshift fort among the evergreens. Running parallel with the river, a long piece of plywood is propped against a few angled posts, an improvised wall notched and splintered along the top, tall enough to obstruct her view, to obstruct her ability to see what lies on the other side. She knows the river is there, frozen beneath a layer of snow, but the only way to glimpse it from inside is to look through the small holes in the wood, almost squares in varying sizes at random heights, openings in the structure's interior, tiny apertures, a series of lookouts, saw cut to take in. I keep returning to this idea of perspective the notion that where I stand changes what I see, how I see. There is self-preservation in each shift, this instinct to parcel the world, to find quiet within. Just after diagnosis, after a proton therapy simulation is carried out to ensure precision targeting, she finds on his body the tattooed constellation of stippled points, three inked marks in a vertical line along the mediastinum, another one on the left side of the torso and one on the right. Five tiny stars they'll infuse with energy, positively charged protons ready to fight. In the darkness beside him, she imagines the light his body, an entire galaxy. She hears in the sound of his voice an unfamiliar intensity. On the night before treatment begins, she finds a horned beetle stilled on the glass beside, on the glass window of the side door with its long antennae, four symmetrical ivory spots on its back. I learn these beetles tunnel into the heartwood of deciduous trees. And the lanternfly climbing the stems of roses in her garden, its nymphs wingless and spotted, black and white. I learn this insect has a host range of over 70 plant species. High populations are infesting common trees all across the United States. The adult lanternfly grows red and gray wings its beauty deceptive, such duplicity, too much to take in sometimes. She is wearied by the world, by the way it seems overrun, choked. She looks closely at her husband after each treatment, looks for signs of change, his skin turning a color she cannot name, his otherwise healthy body endangered now threatened by the cells of stage three disease, this ravaging of healthy tissue, everything invasive. The truth is I can't stop seeing the word life trapped in the middle of proliferate. Outside lantern flies fall from the sky, land on glass ceilings of the hospital lobby, on streets and sidewalks all around me. I try to step on them but as my foot smacks down, they leap away as though someone has warned them. I keep trying, a maniacal dance, a way to convince myself I have even the smallest amount of control. Thank you. Christina, that was beautifully read. I can see a lot of visual applause and it, it's thundering. Thank you. Thank you all. Whew. Um, wow, yeah. It, your piece uh, puts me in mind um, of another piece of, of, about a similar subject, 
although the approach is quite different by Dennis Held called What I'll Miss uh, and direct readers there. Um, oh, I see some beautiful comments coming. Some love is coming in here for you, Christina. Um, by the way, did Simmons tell you that we actually, we frame every chat comment that comes in for you and we'll send it to your new address. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> he might be a little sarcastic there. Oh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I'm just being funny, but actually we could frame it. I'll uh, screen capture it. There you go. There you go. That's what I, that's what I thought you meant. Yeah. We'll definitely send you the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's my pleasure now to turn to Susan Cohen, who is the author of Throat Singing and a Different Wakeful Animal, which received the David Martinson Meadowhawk, Meadowhawk Prize from Red Dragonfly Press. An award-winning science writer and former contributing writer for the Washington Post magazine before earning an MFA from Pacific University, her poems have appeared in the American Journal of Poetry, Atlanta Review, 25th Anniversary Anthology, Pank, Prairie Schooner, Southern Humanities Review, and the Southern Review, and elsewhere. She lives in Berkeley, California, Susan, it's so wonderful to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Derek. I am uh, delighted to be here and truly, truly honored. And uh, that was so powerful, Christina. Um, so I'm going to begin with the poems that appeared in Terrain. Uh, as Derek mentioned, I was a science writer and I still read and a journalist and I still read entirely too much news and uh, including science news. And I found myself writing very short poems with very long titles. Um, and although I don't usually write prose poems, these seem to demand to be prose poems. And I set myself uh, a rule that they could not be longer than four prose lines. So, um, and they all begin with, in the title, with science news. Science news, a wild bird leads people to honey. African hive, hot with bees, a man with a stick calls through his teeth, a bird comes the honey guide. It finds a hive up where a man can't see and the man lights his stick to shove smoke into air. Tree, axed, hive smashed, spilling its frenzy. This is where the sweetness starts. Pond of syrup, meaty wax, open for a bird who learned to be called a man trained by the bird to share. Science news. As animals and plants go extinct, languages die off too. And I should say that this one uh, plays with the word languages and includes um, other words that I found inside of languages. Inside languages, a lung and its lunge for breath, the way the mind can gun the tongue, I wonder how the fox, how the dog, how the doe complete their thoughts, how God speaks with angels or eagles with their gods. Inside, a gauge, an age, lens, how the mind sees, angle, how the tongue twists, the way some sang and their last worlds were sung. Science news, amphibians glow. Humans just couldn't see it until now. Someone thought to shine a blue light and discovered brilliance on a tiger salamander's back, gobs of green. Marbled salamander, Cranwell's horned frog, newt with neon stripes, their beauty limited by the human eye. Possibly such flair serves to unnerve their predators. 
poor newts. They don't know how much we cannot see, and yet we stomp everywhere. So I hope you're finding these um, educational, at least. Science news, snakes had back legs for 70 million years, fossil record says. Let the record show we all were other once, in the bone, a nag, a lag, an ache, a phantom feel. Does the snake belly scrawling dust itch to sit up on its haunches? Does it swim through grass back lit by stars and sense it once kept an eye on the moon? Ages, then a vantage lost. Let the record show we know some prospect is no longer within reach. Science news, gene tweak can extend life 500%, but you have to be a worm. If you can learn to love the fist of darkness, let it close around you. No human touch dancing in the rain, light at the end of the tunnel, a simplicity of soil foamy loam, strip down to the basic muscle of survival and let earth with all it brings pass through you. Life extends its linear line. Now, how long is long enough? Um, I'm gonna read two more uh, poems. And uh, this next one was is a recent poem, was written during the pandemic. Uh, on a very raw day a few months ago, we went out to the coast and we saw the most amazing spectacle, uh, which was hundreds of sea lions uh, swimming towards shore, uh, doing what they call porpoising. And, um, and, uh, and so I, I wrote this based on that. It's called Hoop After Hoop. If not for the orcas, the sea lions would not be leaping out of their silky wet skins, hurtling towards shore and arcing like dolphins. If our mouths were not masked, our excitement would be unmuffled as stranger calls out to stranger and points at the hundreds of slicked bodies in synchronized panic. December, but a crowd, is strung along clifftops. We want sharpened air to startle our lungs into opening wider. We need something outside of ourselves. If not for a few spumes like sparklers at the horizon, no one would know there were orcas pursuing death coldly as the sea lions make for bare rock. Watching them jump in waves through the waves, like a troop performing while the ocean holds up hoop after hoop, we could think this simply was joy. And I'm gonna finish with a, a, a poem from my book. This is the first poem in a different wakeful animal. And um, I feel very lucky to be in California uh, over this past year where we could get out into nature and um, and, and it sustains us. So this poem is called Quiver. It begins with a few lines from Louise Glick who wrote, my body, it is not the earth I will miss, it is you I will miss. I say good riddance to my body, it's conspiracy of veins and bowels and vertebrae. I can trust a deer to pick its way through trees, a daffodil to bully its way through frost. Once I saw the silhouette of a baby seal held inside the translucence of a wave like a portrait in a locket. How quartz threads through rock and a heron threads through air then lands and stills to a piece of quartz. The way even weeds flower. Just now, the dullest brown bird appeared, clumsy at our feeder and picked at soggy seed. I watched the quiver of its tail while it fed its hunger. Need I say 
bodies must be fed. I say the earth is the body I will miss. Even if I could only touch it disembodied, send a shiver down the outstretched limb of a single eucalyptus. Even if I could touch down only in, in the linear brittle body of a dragonfly, one evening some might fall, skim the skin and flit. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Susan, a lot of the, the applause is roaring again. A lot of uh, love coming in over the over the channel. Oh, Annie Haven McDonald, uh, another poetry editor terrain.org weighing in. I guess I just want to say for myself, I, I so appreciate how your poems honor word and world and the one I know someone pointed out that one of their favorites was the the language um, science news. And I thought that was an interesting um, connection to Christina's piece um, where she um, kept seeing the word life and proliferate. Um, and that image, Susan, um, that baby seal in the wave image. Holy moly, that's like an Arthur Z moment. That is, that was really cool. Well, I, I'm incredibly honored that you think there was a single Arthur Z moment in my poems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, so let's see here. Who we've got next? Cameron Walker, Hammer and Cameron. Hey, listen. So, um, I use terrain.org a lot in my classes and I like all the time. And especially since COVID, you know, we've, I've had to find new ways to assess students um, and um, test them on work that they haven't seen before. Cameron, I was so taken with your story that I've got 24 freshmen, college freshmen and sophomore right now sweating over what it really means uh, for their final exam in Introduction to Literature. So uh, I'll send you a few of those because um, uh, actually I was reading one the other day, it was, it was outstanding. We had read some, if any of them are on here, I hope you're not on here because this might be cheating, but uh, that's okay. We had read some uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, uh, just like a few weeks ago. So I think they were ready for your story. Um, listen, Cameron is a writer based in California. Her fiction has appeared in the Missouri Review, New South uh, and District Lit. And her essay collection, Points of Light, is forthcoming from Hidden Rivers Press. We hope, COVID willing, pandemic willing, it may be coming from Hidden River Press, okay? She writes regularly for the science blog, The Last Word on Nothing. And geez, congratulations on having the great Joy Castro pick your story, Cameron. Oh, thank you. And thank you to Joy and thank you to Simmons and Terrain and Christina and Susan and Arthur and everybody else here. It's just so nice to be with you. And so this is a little Reader's Digest version of this story. Starfish. The voices of the teachers come through the computer speakers. Each child must pick a project. My oldest son picks the state of Oregon. My middle son draws pictures of mythological creatures, a minotaur, a pegasus, a dragon. My youngest son is not yet in school, so he picks flowers out of the flower bed and replants them back in the same soil. More flowers, mama, he says. I pick a project too. I decide to study starfish. There is a tattoo of a starfish on the inside of my left wrist. I got it when my brother disappeared. They're called sea stars, my oldest son says. They're not fish, they're echinoderms. Echinoderms. I look it up online. 
These include sea stars, brittle stars, sand dollars, sea urchins, and crinoids. I look up crinoids. There are two kinds, feather stars and sea lilies. My sons say they would like a snack. I find a knife and cut an apple into thin slices. I arrange the slices around the edge of a plate and put grilled cheese sandwiches in the middle. When my children ask about my brother, I tell them he was a marine biologist. He went to distant research stations with names like flowers, Kaikura, Murea. I show my sons on a map. Each day of the quarantine, my boys become slightly less human. We're at home avoiding a virus that turns people's lungs into liquid. Instead, my children are turning into sea creatures as the sea is the only place it is safe to go. We walk there every morning and the dark green water pulls at my throat like a magnet. It seems to be pulling too on the salt water deep within my son's cells. At the beach, I find a stick and draw labyrinths in the sand. At first, my sons are interested in following the path, but then they realize that the way in is the same as the way out. They stand at the water's edge and let the sea lick at their toes. My oldest son writes that Oregon is a place with beautiful trees and an interesting history. He has been there once and remembers nothing except that we watched movies in the car. We do not know when we can travel again, so instead I show the boys the postcards that my brother sent me from all over the world. On a postcard from Tahiti, there is a photo of a flower that looks like an open hand. On the other side, there's a printed caption. Legend has it that the TRA Apitahi is the hand of a girl who believed her true love would never return. At the top of the sacred mountain, she broke off her arm and planted it in the earth to represent her love. People have tried to grow the flower elsewhere, but these attempts have been unsuccessful. Fewer than 100 flowers remain. I do not show my sons what my brother wrote. He had scrawled scientific names and a series of numbers on the back, as if he had been taking notes instead of writing to me. My oldest son grows small, pale blue tentacles above his upper lip like a mustache. My middle son, the artist, begins collecting colorful things, marbles, strands of yarn, Lego pieces. He glues the things he finds to his back, which has grown rounded and hard. My youngest son looks for more flowers to cut and replant. He has taken everything our garden has. We walk to the beach again. If we go early, we see hardly anyone else. A good thing, because people have started wearing masks and it frightens my sons to see people who are only bodies and eyes. It might frighten people more to see my sons. The youngest is sprouting new feathery limbs from his shoulders. My boys walk alongside each other. Often they fight, but sometimes they take each other's hands. My youngest looking at the older boys as if they were twin sons. I remember when my brother and I were like this. He was the big one, I was small, and I looked at him the same way. My heart squeezes in on itself. I draw the lines of another labyrinth and place a round flat rock at its center. Starfish are brutal, my brother told me once. They stick their stomachs out through their mouths. They can pry open clams and dissolve the insides into digestive goo. My parents still talk about my brother when I call them in Florida. He was the oldest, he glowed with promise. My father still knows the names of the species my brother studied. Reef starfish, sunflower sea star, crown of thorns. My parents don't know all the other things my brother studied, the ones that studied him back, flunitrazepam, methamphetamine. They believe he's still on an expedition that when my brother returns, he will bring something marvelous and strange. When I was young, my brother and I would stay up late to look at the constellations and talk about the future. My brother wanted to be a famous marine biologist, like Jacques Cousteau, except not French. I wanted to be an astronaut. 
Now I'm a mother and he is almost certainly dead. I imagine his own stomach swallowing him after it grew tired of what he was feeding it. The virus spreads both around us and within. My oldest child is the one that stays most human. So many tentacles, but still he has arms and legs and a mouth. I have to haul the youngest boy to the beach in the wagon because his feathery limbs no longer support him on land. I draw a big labyrinth in the sand and my middle son clatters through it sideways. I follow him and find he has shed his entire shell and left it in the center. When I look again, he inhabits an even larger shell, this one iridescent, protecting all his softness. It is better than a mask. I can't even see his eyes. At home, I take out the last postcard I got from my brother. I have never shown the boys this one. My brother scribbled over both sides of the card, his writing even covering the photo of a beach somewhere in Bali. The writing is in a language I've never seen. The only familiar part is my address. I trace the sea star on the inside of my wrist. My brother always could see the smallest fissures in me, the ones that no one else could. When he disappeared, there was no one left who could break me. At first I was relieved. Now I miss how well he saw me more than anything more than teachers in their real classrooms with my children, more than a world where everyone has faces and can hold each other by the hand. When the boys ask for a snack, the only way I recognize them is by their hunger. I see the knife on the kitchen counter, ready to cut an apple into slices, a carrot into sticks. The silver blade makes me shiver, but I know what I need to do. My oldest son binds up the wound. The capital of Oregon is Salem, he tells me. My middle son finds a picture of Medusa. He puts a crayon into his claw and writes, mom, on the picture. He adds a crooked heart. They watch while I plant my hand in the garden. My tattoo disappears under the dirt. When my flower grows bigger, I take it down to the water. At my wedding, I stood at the edge of another ocean and tossed a rose into the water to remember all the people who weren't there with us. My brother had flown in from the South Pacific. His skin was the warbled texture of tree bark, his breath sweet with rum. It was the last time I ever saw him. This time, when the flower of my hand floats out to sea, my children follow. The sun reflects so relentlessly off the waves that it is hard even to see their outlines. For a moment, I imagine the world if my children had never been and whether the things I had lost, my left hand, my brother, what I thought was my life, would reappear to take their place. I miss my brother so much. I call his name without thinking. And then I can't stop. I call the names of the sea stars, the names of the drugs, the names I gave my sons before they were born, the names of the creatures they are now, anemone and decorator crab and feather star. I step into the water, soaking my shoes, my pants, my shirt. I have been wearing these clothes so long, I no longer recognize myself. I no longer would know my own name if the sea gave it back to me. Then my sons, my creatures surround me. Their claws, their tentacles, their hands caress the stump at the end of my arm. Do sea stars tingle like this when they feel a limb go missing? Is there somewhere that the vanished part still exists, even when something new grows in to take its place? My hand does not reappear, but my children do. My youngest son rests his face against my belly and there is no brush of feathers, only skin. You went swimming in your clothes, he says. I want to do that too. At home, my sons take photos of their projects and upload the photos to the online classrooms. The teachers give each project a tiny image of a heart. My middle son sheds his last shell and reorganizes his art supplies. 
My oldest son's eyes are watchful, like you always are after something has changed you. My youngest son asks me to take a picture of the flowers he has replanted in the garden. Mama, give me a heart for my photo, like my brother's, he says. I touch my fingertip to the image of the empty heart on the screen, and it fills up. Together, my son and I water the flowers. He looks longingly at my other hand. Thanks so much. Wow. <clears throat> I just uh, so admire the tonal com complexity of that piece. Um, I have to confess, I was watching Kim Stafford's face when you mentioned Salem, Oregon, just to see if there was a flicker and nothing. The guy was, he was listening so closely. Even Salem, Oregon didn't, you know, didn't get a, anything. And of course, if you're an Ursula Le Guin fan, Salem, Oregon means something to you too. Omelas, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of love coming in for Hammer and Cameron. Mm-hmm. Yep, gorgeous. So, hey, uh, we have a treat um, for our last reader tonight. We have Arthur Z. And um, I have to tell you that he's just a heck of a nice guy, this Arthur Z. First of all, that he didn't put that in his bio, but I'm putting that in his bio. And his 10th book of poetry, Sightlines, received the 2019 National Book Award for Poetry. Um, it looks like this. His new book, um, which is a new and collected poems, is called The Glass Constellation. And it looks like this. It is, uh, it's just been published, just published by P Copper Canyon Press. And here's some math for you. Five decades, 10 books, and 26 new poems. Uh, one of the marvelous features of this gorgeous collection is it doubles as a weightlifting <laughs> article. Okay. Um, Arthur, congratulations on this is, you just must be over the moon. Look at this cover here. This is, this is gorgeous. And I know that you've been, I was reading an interview somewhere of you and I know that you've been holding on to that title, The Glass Constellation for some time, waiting for the, for the right time to use it. Um, thank you so much, my friend, for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here this evening and reading with Christina, Susan, and Cameron. Thank you, Derek, for hosting. Um, thank you, Simmons, and thank all of you for being here. I'm going to read uh, one poem from Sightlines and then uh, some poems from the section of new poems in the Glass Constellation. And this first poem is in the voice of salt. It's called Salt Song. Zunis make shrines on the way to a lake where I emerge. And Miwoks gather me out of pools along the Pacific. The cheetah thirsts for me. And when you sprinkle me on ribeye, you have no idea how I balance silence with thunder in crystal. You dream of butterfly hunting in Madagascar. Spelunking through caves, echoing with dripping stalactites. And you don't see how I yearn to shimmer in orange aurora against flame. Look at me in your hand. In Egypt, I scrub the bodies of kings and queens. In Pakistan, I zigzag upward through 26 miles of tunnels before drawing my first breath in sunlight. If you heat a kiln to 2,380 degrees and scatter me inside, I vaporize and bond with clay. In this unseen moment, a potter prays because my pattern is out of his hands. 
And when I touch your lips, you salivate. And when I dissolve on your tongue, your hair rises, ozone unlocks. A single stroke of lightning sizzles to earth. This next poem is an experiment in repetition. It's called The White Orchard. And rather than say repeat, you know, the same word at the beginning of a line, I gave myself the stricture of um, requiring each line to pick up a word or words from the previous line. The White Orchard. Under a supermoon, you gaze into the orchard. A glass blower shapes a glowing orange mass into a horse. You step into a space where you once lived. Crushed mica glitters on plastered walls. A raccoon strolls in moonlight along the top of an adobe wall. Swimming in a pond, we notice a reflected cottonwood on the water. Clang, a deer leaps over the gate. Every 15 minutes, an elephant is shot for its tusks. You mark a bleached earless lizard against the snowfall of this white page. The skins of eggplants glistening in a garden, or bodies glistening by firelight. Though skunks once ravaged corn or bright moments cannot be ravaged. Sleeping near a canal, you hear lapping waves. At dawn, waves lapping and the noise of men unloading scallops and shrimp. No noise of gunshots. You focus on the branches of hundred year old apple trees. Opening the door, we find red and yellow rose petals scattered on our bed. Then light years, you see pear branches farther in the orchard as the moon rises. Branches bending under the snow of this white page. Pyrocumulus. Peony shoots rise out of the earth. At 5 a.m., walking up the ridge, I mark how in April, Orion's left arm was an apex in the sky. And by May, only Venus flickered above the ridge against the blue edge of sunrise. In daylight, a pear tree explodes with white blossoms. No black-footed ferret slips across my path. No boreal owl stirs on a branch. At 3 a.m., dogs seethed and howled when a black bear snagged a shriveled apple off a branch. And waking out of a black pool, I glimpsed how fire creates its own weather in rising pyrocumulus, reaching the ditch I drop the gate. It's time for the downhill pipes to fill. Time for bamboo at the house to suck up water. Time to see sunlight flare between leaves before the scorching edge of afternoon. Sleepers. A black-chinned hummingbird lands on a metal wire and rests 
for five seconds. For five seconds, a pianist lowers his head and rests his hands on the keys. A man bathes where irrigation water forms a pool before it drains into the river. A mechanic untwists a plug and engine oil drains into a bucket. For five seconds, I smell peppermint through an open window. Recall where a wild leaf grazed your skin. Here touch comes before sight. Holding you, I recall across a canal, the sounds of men laying cuttlefish on ice at first light. Before first light, physical contact or hearts beating, patter of female rain on the roof. As the hummingbird whirs out of sight, the gears of a clock mesh at varying speeds. We hear a series of ostinato notes and are not tied to our body's weight on earth. Uh, just two more poems. This next poem is called Circumference. Vanilla farmers in Madagascar sit in the dark with rifles. At 2 a.m. after a thunderstorm, I lurch down the hallway to check the oak floor under a skylight, place a towel in a pan. As if armed, waiting for a string to trip a thief, I listen in the hush at a point where ink flows out of a pen onto a white Sahara of a page. Adjusting the rear view mirror in the car before backing out of the garage, I ask, what is the logarithm of a dream? How do you trace a sphere whose center is nowhere? It is hard to believe farmers pollinate vanilla orchids with toothpick-sized needles, yet we do as needed. Pouring syrup on a pancake, I catch the scent of vines, race along the circumference, sensing what it's like to sit in the dark with nothing in my hands. And this last poem is called Transpirations. Leafing branches of a backyard plum. Branches of water on a dissolving ice sheet. Chatter of magpies when you approach. Lilacs lean over the road weighted with purple blossoms. Then the noon sun shimmers the grasses. You ride the surge into summer. Smell of pinyon crackling in the fireplace. Blue notes of a saxophone in the air. Not by sand running through an hourglass, but by our bodies igniting. Passing in the form of vapors from a living body. This world of orange sunlight and wildfire haze. World of iron filings pulled toward magnetic south and north. Pool of quicksilver when you bend to tie your shoes. Standing, you well up with glistening eyes. Have you lived with utmost care? Have you articulated emotions like the edges of leaves? 
adjusting your breath to the seasonal rhythm of grasses, gazing into a lake on a salt flat and drinking in reflection the Milky Way. Thank you. Ooh. Arthur, we have some amazing listeners here tonight. Um, we'll make sure and get you the, the chat record because there was just some beautiful things said about your, your poems. And um, I remember hearing um, the poet Mark Irwin in conversation use the term detonations to talk about the effect that um, your poems often create, those, uh, those uh, juxtapositions that you have. Um, thank you so much. That was gorgeous. Um, I kind of not, I kind of like, don't want to be speaking words into my computer right now, but just to go away and think about, think about those poems. But here I am. Um, ah, listen, hey, uh, I don't know if I glimpsed any questions out there, just kind of um, some really um, astute observations about our various readers tonight. Simmons, Elizabeth, did you see anything that I missed? I may have forgotten to let folks know they could post their questions in the chat. Oh, I did. I okay. did. Yeah. So they're just not listening to you. It's not me. Okay. Just making sure. They were hey, waiting man. for the opportunity now. Uh, one of your neighbors from Santa Fe is, is chiming in there. Hi, Annie. Kim Stafford is stunned. Somewhere near Salem, Oregon, Stafford is stunned. I just want to say that it was a beautiful evening. Everybody read beautifully. That's that's Rena Espayat talking, folks. Great to see you, Rena. Great to be here. And you know, while we're talking about Kim Stafford, he will be reading in this series in July. So the fourth Monday of July. Join us, same time, same virtual space. But actually, you no. Know, remember, we talked about this, Simmons. They can only they can only attend that reading if they buy the books by all the readers tonight. <laughs> shameless, utterly shameless. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Thank you for your comments all and and boy we have a we have a, a real global village here tonight. Derek there was a question by Annie McDonald in the chat that is asking the the readers tonight she's interested to hear how the pandemic has affected everyone's writing this year. Thank you everyone that is the voice of Taylor Brorby. Um, so, panelists, readers, how has the pandemic affected your writing? Thank you for that question, Annie. Well, what I, I, if, I, if I may just jump in, it's given me another, another reason to appreciate uh, communication. I, uh, I came here without English. I, I was, came with seven, seven years of age and no English. And the first eight months I was here, I couldn't speak to anybody. So communication is vital to me. I must understand what people are saying and I must make myself understood. So that's why, that's why these readings are so spectacular, why they mean so much because it's a chance to get into somebody else's head. And this, this pandem pandemic has isolated us so that these, these meetings by technology this way are, are very meaningful. They're very valuable. They're not like the real thing, but they're so much better than nothing. Thank you, Rena. 
Um, for those of you who may not know, you probably know Rena Espayat's work. If you if you may if you don't, um, I do encourage you to check it out, and especially the poem speaking of communication, bilingual, bilingue, which I think is one of the great poems in the language, and I teach it every quarter. Thank you. Now, Arthur Z, you were you were unclicking there to say something about how the pandemic has affected your writing. Well, I just wanted to say, and Annie, you know Santa Fe, so um, the Santa Fe area has a whole series of uh, what are called acequias or irrigation ditches that uh, feed from runoff from the mountains. And um, I live on Upper Canyon Road and I belong to this ditch association where we share um, water 24 seven and each person on the ditch has the right to draw water off of it for, you know, say like Sunday morning to Monday morning. Anyhow, it, uh, the pandemic has pushed me out more into nature and I find myself just observing more closely and looking around me more carefully. And at the same time, even though there has to be social distancing, it's really bonded everyone on the ditch because it, there's a kind of communal effort to make sure that the ditch isn't backed up and overflowing, that people are using the water when they say they are. So on the one hand, the pandemic uh, has made me sort of focus more in nature, but it's also made me more aware of human contacts and how precious that is. Thank you, Arthur. It's hard for me to imagine you observing things more closely than you have been frankly, but I'll just throw that out there. How about um, the rest of you? And I have to say, Cameron, Kathy River Shannon is with us tonight. So you saw that, fantastic. Um, would uh, others of you uh, panelists like to speak to uh, how the pandemic has, has affected you and your writing? Uh, I would just answer badly. <laughs> uh, I think I wrote a lot, a lot of, I had, trouble writing uh, and every uh, an awful lot of what I wrote last year I think was was uh, bad um, but like Arthur um, I appreciated nature even more uh, and um, it nurtured me and uh, I found that when I did start being able to write some poems again um, they came out of the they came out of nature, and um, uh, that's that's the only thing that's really uh, worked for me over the last year. Thank you, Susan. Christina, um, I absolutely agree. Um, I think I've really become more aware. I've become a better observer, um, much more curious about the world around me um, because nature is the only thing I didn't have to be distanced from. And I don't know, I, I don't know, I think a lot of writers are also introverts, um, but I am. And so my life didn't really change all that much um, in terms of, I was, I, I'm like, I've, I hesitate to say this because it's a terrible thing that has happened um, for us to all be, you know, quarantined and things like that. But I kind of self quarantine myself a lot in life. Um, and so it didn't change me much in terms of my writing habits. Um, I like being alone and I'm very much an introvert. So I was the one person saying, you know, I don't really mind the, the difference, the changes. Um, but I definitely have gained an appreciation for nature more so than I ever had before. Thank you, Christina. Cameron? I think I agree with everything everyone just said, just more time in nature. I also enjoy time by myself. So in that way, that's part of it that's been really wonderful. Um, to be here to have time to observe. And just today I saw there's a scrub jay here that's building a nest under the eaves. And I, I feel like it might've been something I wouldn't have noticed last year. And now I wanna just follow the scrub jay and 
see him him or her build the nest so mm. thank you uh cameron if you do follow that scrub jay um and keep doing that you'll turn into someone like david sibley that's what happened to him well um uh, from from David's uh, from David's own mouth. Uh, so thank you all for these reflections and more nature says Annie. I agree. Yes, bring it on. Um, are we? I think we're, this is probably a good time to say good night. It's getting late um, for Rena. It's um, maybe about her bedtime there on the East Coast. No, Rena. I never I never go to bed before midnight. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> okay, it's someone's bedtime here. It's probably maybe Taylor Brorby. Uh, well, no, actually, it's not Taylor's either. No, oh, it is. It is. No, no. no. Okay. Hey, you let us see you. You let us see you. This is what the non-showered professor looks like on a Monday <laughs> night. Uh, I, Deborah, I loved your comment. I've done a lot of Zooms and must say, I really feel at home with this group of poets. That's what we aim for. Um, I'll that, tell you a treat that, that you gave me. And that was with the time that you read with your daughter the other day. That, oh, was, that was delightful. That was utterly delightful. Oh, thank you. That I, You know what? That was a gift of um, the pandemic situation, because I don't think she would have done that in an in-person reading, but because we were just sitting in front of a computer, she, she did it. Um, but yeah, this is probably a, a great time. You look great, Taylor, Elizabeth Jacobson says. I agree. Um, Shaggy is in, buddy. Shaggy works for you. Okay. Why it's softly lit, you don't know how long this <laughs> hair has gotten this year. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, uh, thank you again all for joining us tonight. Um, had such beautiful listeners and um, please do turn it to do tune in next month when we have Jane Hirschfield and Drew Lanham in the house and um, and more great people upcoming, including I know, as Simmons mentioned, the Kim Stafford in July. Um, Simmons, do we need to say anything else except good night? Well, how about thank you to the two of you for doing this? Well, it takes a village, right? Thanks yes. everybody for joining us. Sure. Have a wonderful evening and uh, check terrain.org often. We're publishing now about five pieces a week on average. So thanks for coming out. <laughs>